Foreign Minister Lavrov, welcome to the program. Thank you. We're here at an extraordinarily difficult and painful time. What's happening in Syria has got the world very, very upset. In the United Kingdom, people are saying that this is the worst bombardment of civilians since the Nazis bombed Guernica during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, John Kerry has said that Russia and the regime, the Syrian regime, owe the world more than an explanation about why they keep hitting hospitals, medical facilities, women and children. Why are you doing that? Well, I think all these statements have to be verified because we, just an, uh, as in the case of uh, accusations regarding hackers' attacks against Democratic Party, we never got any confirmation of the uh, accusations which we received. We have been asking the facts. We have insisted on the investigation of the attack on the humanitarian convoy uh, in Alep on the 19th of uh, October. Uh, and uh, what uh, my friend and new colleague Boris Johnson was saying uh, was absolutely uh, politicking, not not well, he was in, accusing in, Russia of having hit. Oh yeah, well, in the usual, in the usual arrogant way. Uh, well, Boris is the jack of uh, all trades, as you know, having served as a mayor. He said he was very good friend of Russia, and uh, he was very famous at the Russian festivals in London. Now I think he's getting ready for becoming. Uh, some maybe internationally recognized prosecutor general in The Hague, uh, especially after our British colleagues uh, decided that uh, the slogan, yes, we can, uh, should be uh, additioned by, and you cannot, when they decided to remove their military uh, from the jurisdiction of uh, European Human Rights Convention, as you know. So it's some kind of some kind of clarity must be introduced in all these discussions. We are open for these discussions. We, we never cut connections. We want to discuss things and to arrive at some truth mm -hmm. instead of uh, uh, accusing each other without any justification. Well, with respect, most of the world believes, having seen what's going on, having satellite imagery, knowing that there are only two forces with the kind of air power around Aleppo, that is you and the Syrians with the barrel bombs, believe that you are involved and at the very least you are not stopping the Syrian Air Force and the barrel bombs. So again, I need to ask you, on behalf of the international community, why is it that Russia is targeting civilian infrastructure or allowing the Syrians to do the same? And as you know, you are basically now being accused of war crimes. Well, war crimes uh, is something which we can discuss uh, in the appropriate uh, structures. There are internationally recognized procedures for this, and it's better to do this, to use them rather than the media, uh, to make yourself more visible, uh, which is the goal of quite a number of my colleagues, unfortunately. Uh, on the investigation of the humanitarian convoy attack, the United Nations Secretary General launch the investigation, and I strongly insist those who have any information related to what happened, they should uh, respect the investigation and submit the information uh, to the Secretary General of the United Nations. On the uh, demands, you know, for um, to stop uh, fighting in Aleppo, uh, you know, when the uh, Nusra and the people who are next to it in eastern Aleppo in August and September categorically blocked all humanitarian supplies via Castello Road, by the way, which was bombed severely yesterday. Uh, but when they said that they would attack any humanitarian convoy coming via Castello Road in August and September, uh, no one raised a finger, no one got worried. Uh, I, when I mention about this to John Kerry and others, they say, we don't remember that this was the case. I do remember, and uh, it was actually uh, this ultimatum from Nusra and the, and the like uh, was made when we were meeting with Kerry uh, in Geneva on 26th of August. Uh, but the key uh, problem is the total uh, inability of the United States and those who are also members of uh, the coalition led by the Americans to separate the moderates from Nusra. This is the key priority uh, registered in the Russian-American initiative. And the American uh, colleagues, including John Brennan, as uh, early as February this year, promised to us that they need two, two weeks to separate the moderates who cooperate with the coalition from Nusra. 
they never did. And now we have an impression that what the Americans and others really want uh, is to spare Nusra and to keep it uh, in case they decided to use Plan B. Mr. Mr. Lavrov, I want to show you this picture. Sure. This went viral in August. This is a little boy. He's got a name. It's called Omran Dakni. She's five years old. This is not a terrorist. This is a boy who is surrounded Absolutely. and besieged Absolutely. and bombarded Absolutely. in Aleppo. What do you say to the civilians who are simply asking for the right to not be bombed? That is a war crime, sir. Uh, well, as I said, the war crimes uh, must be investigated. But what do you say to people like, like that? Well, it's, it's, it's a tragedy. It's really a tragedy. And they must insist that the moderates who want to protect them they must separate themselves from Nusra. So can I ask you about that? Because you talk about the US-Russia uh, ceasefire, uh, which collapsed after barely a week. We understand from s reporting of people who've actually seen the paperwork that that was meant to be at least a week of a ceasefire. The two of you were meant to jointly separate. But the ceasefire collapsed before there was even a week to allow that. You know, we insisted uh, when uh, uh, Putin and Obama met uh, in uh, China on the 6th of September, I think, we insisted that before any uh, ceasefire can be uh, in place, they must deliver on their very old promise to separate the moderates from Nusra. Eventually, eventually, uh, we agreed to accept the American approach and we agreed to launch the ceasefire uh, for seven days, during which they must have finished uh, the separation of the we moderates from Nusra. It was meant to be afterwards. I'll but three days. you separate if there's no ceasefire? But yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one second, one second, one second. Uh, but, and, we, and we launched the ceasefire only to see the American coalition attacking uh, their resort the positions of the Syrian army, three days uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, seven-day period. They said it was a mistake, but I read a statement of the official Pentagon representative, Sam Colonel Thompson, who said that this mistake, this mistaken strike, uh, was being prepared for two full days and was based on very good intelligence. Oh. I don't, think, I, don't think, I don't think you can easily avoid uh, uh, this, this uh, situation because immediately after this mistaken strike, ISIL launched an offensive in their reserve. But you're surely the, not suggesting that the United States of America has any interest in empowering Islamic terrorists? Do I don't it? know. Mr. Fong. Look, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda was born uh, from the American support of Mujahideens in Afghanistan. Uh, by the way, Nusra is another manifestation of Al-Qaeda, according to the American list, according to the UN list. Uh, and uh, ISIL was born, was born after the American invasion of Iraq, as you know, I'm right. sure. But, but, sir, you don't really think that, that they encourage that. But anyway, let's not get into that. I need to ask I, you I, I, I don't want to suspect them in encouraging terrorism, but what they do uh, as regards Nusra makes me very, very suspicious. Well, let me ask you. Clearly, you both have an interest, presumably, in getting some kind of peace, some kind of ceasefire. Do you? Do you still believe that there is a political solution to the war in Syria? Because now most people think that the very clever diplomat, Sergei Lavrov, has strung along John Kerry in order to be able to actually solidify facts on the ground on behalf of your client, Bashar Assad, and try to get Aleppo so that he has a whole load of populated areas? Uh, well, speaking of, uh, you know, who is, uh, whose <laughs> client uh, or else, uh, we want um, to have a meeting of the countries who have direct influence on what is going on on the ground, either by way of being there uh, on the invitation of the Syrian government and without being invited, or uh, having influence through financing and supplying arms, uh, supporting those who fight the government. So you have an, a plan for another... I believe, I believe that we have to stop uh, relying on, you know, some um, uh, emigrants who present themselves as representatives of the opposition. Uh, and this uh, capricious high negotiating committee, I believe, has proven that it is absolutely irresponsible. And I am amazed that our Western friends, uh, who created the group called Friends of Syria, keep insisting that this high negotiating committee is the 
only uh, opposition group uh, to talk to. So you and, don't accept them but anymore? No, we, we accept them. We invited them. We want to meet with them. They, uh, you know, try to be important uh, or to look important and they refuse to meet with us until and unless Assad is gone, uh, which is absolutely against the resolutions of the Security Council. But countries who have direct influence on the ground, they include uh, well, Russia and the United States, no doubt about this, but also uh, three or four regional countries. And we would like uh, to have a meeting uh, in this uh, narrow format uh, to have a business-like discussion, not another uh, General Assembly-like debate. When do you plan to have this? Uh, well, it is scheduled to be uh, this coming Saturday. So this is news? Uh, well, this is news which I hope uh, will not just uh, remain in use, uh, for a day or two, but which will launch a serious dialogue uh, on the basis of the principles contained in the Russian-American deal, uh, which was broadly welcomed, but which unfortunately was not launched. And I come back to the reasons. The violation of the ceasefire happened by the American coalition who attacked the Syrian government, which they were not supposed to do, and which they said they would never uh, plan. Uh, but uh, the, the very interesting and very specific criteria, uh, which was uh, not uh, respected by the United States, was the deal um, described in greatest detail uh, regarding pulling back from the Castello Road. Mm -hmm. The government from one side of the road, the opposition to another, from another side of the road, uh, the distances for heavy weaponry uh, for the personnel were agreed a kilometer, a kilometer and a half, three kilometers, and so on and so forth. And when we uh, tried to relaunch this is fire, there was a deal that this would be part of it. Three-day quiet, humanitarian deliveries via Castello Road. Uh, and the Americans said that they cannot uh, make sure that the position pulls back, which made, made us believe that they, they're not so influential on the ground. That's why the participation of the regional powers is very important. I think this would be more, uh, more instrumental than just talking to the United States. Who do you mean by regional powers? Well, several of them you would know. Uh, Iran, Saudi Tur Arabia, Turkey, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, probably. So this is for Saudi. We're going to continue our conversation. I want to ask you, before I move on to the US-Russia hacking scandal, which is, is crisis, um, about Syria, finally, you said that you want more talks. What, though, is your military plan? Look, you've, everybody says there's no military solution, but Russia looks like it is after a military solution. At the very least, to capture Aleppo, so that Assad has that in the waning days of the Obama administration. That is what the Americans believe. Is that your plan? No. Uh, we strongly supported, uh, if you speak about Aleppo, we strongly supported the initiative by Staffan de Mistura, uh, who proposed that Nusra should be invited to leave eastern Aleppo with the weapons, uh, in dignity, as he put it. Uh, even, you know, with all the Security Council uh, decisions regarding no deals with terrorists, we uh, supported de Mistura's initiative. Uh, for Nusra to leave, and those uh, moderates who want to live together with Nusra, uh, and for the moderates who would stay in Aleppo uh, to sign up to the cessation of hostilities with the government. Uh, this was actually the, the uh, crux of our draft resolution, which we put uh, to a vote in the Security Council immediately after we uh, blocked a very one-sided French, uh, French paper. Uh, but this uh, Russian, uh, Russian draft, containing the support of Demis Tura's proposal uh, was not supported and was voted against by uh, all Western representatives and some other members of the Security Council. We still believe and we are convinced that this plan of Demis Tura must be given a chance and we are working on it now uh, with the people on the ground and I hope that very soon we can, we can uh, hear some news. Because without, without separating terrorists, without getting terrorists out, let them go to Idlib, which is the capital of Nusra, and, uh, uh, and be there, because it would be easier uh, for all of us you know, to rejoin forces uh, against these, these groups. But otherwise, otherwise uh, I don't think you can really uh, expect the army of Syria 
to stop fighting Nusra, who is trying to use civilians as the human shield. We make all necessary precautions, uh, and we will continue to make all necessary precautions to advise the Syrian army uh, to be uh, very specific and very uh, targeted, you know, in, 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 in its actions against Nusra. But Nusra cannot be tolerated, and we don't want uh, to think, but we have to, you know, <laughs> we have to, that our uh, partners in the region and uh, in the United States and in Europe are trying to spare Nusra. That's maybe what you think. There are obviously only about 900 Nusra people in Aleppo, according to the United Nations, 275,000 civilians, including women and children. I guess, you know, the only question is, do you want to be on the wrong side of history on this? Do you want to be supporting the massacre of civilians in this kind of situation? And is that what will make Russia great again in the Middle East, to, to be building some kind of base, some kind of footprint there on the backs, as it's been said, of the broken bodies of children, women, and non Christian, it's exactly the 250,000 civilians uh, about whom we think when we say that if it, if it, if it takes getting a couple of thousand of uh, terrorists out of the city to save quarter million lives, then let's do it. And that's why the Mistura plan is something which we must, we must uh, promote. And by the way, uh, we just two days ago, uh, Nusra signed a deal with Ahrar al-Sham, uh, which is not included on the United Nations terrorist list, and which we believe uh, must be revisited, like a uh, couple of dozens of other organizations whom Americans list uh, as moderates. They, uh, uh, unacceptably joining forces with Nusra, not only in Aleppo, but in many other parts of Syria. So, you know, when the Security Council decided on how to handle the Syrian crisis, uh, there were several uh, directions of international community uh, action. One was uh, counter-terrorism. Another was a cessation of hostilities, humanitarian issues, and political process. And each of these directions must be addressed on its merits. There must be no preconditions according to the Security Council. And regarding, you know, being on the right or wrong side of history, uh, or uh, regarding, you know, statements like uh, whether Russia is a great country, uh, or whether Russia is a rogue state, uh, <laughs> with all respect, uh, our Anglo-Saxon uh, friends have centuries-old tradition uh, to decide, you know, who is uh, a decent country, who is a great country, and who is a rogue state. And I understand that uh, under the uh, present uh, situation in the world, uh, when the world is really becoming multipolar, uh, they are losing, they, they, they have a feeling that they are losing this ability to decide for everyone. This is, this is a philosophical issue. We take it with patience. But this is painful for them, unfortunately. Well, that's, why, that's, why, that's why, you know, we uh, prefer in politics to be guided not, not by hysterical statements, not by hysterical Russophobic rhetoric, but by business-like approach. If we want to save lives, we have to be very pragmatic and very specific. All right, let's move on to intervention in a different way. As you know, the United States has formally said that they have absolute confidence that it is Russia which is hacking and has hacked into the party, the Democratic Party emails, and interfered with the democratic process. Uh, today, the United States has said that they will respond proportionately. Does that worry you? Well, it's flattering, of course, uh, to, to, to get this uh, kind of attention uh, for a regional power, as uh, President Obama called us some time ago, now uh, everybody in the United States uh, is saying that it is Russia which is running the United Nations presidential debate. Uh, it's, it's flattering, as I said, but it has nothing, you know, to, 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 be, to be explained by the facts. We have, we have not seen a single fact, a single proof, and uh, we have not seen any answer to the proposal which one year ago, almost one year ago, November 2015, the Russian Prosecutor General's Office 
uh, conveyed to the Department of Justice to start professional consultations on cyber crime. Uh, when I told John Kerry that this proposal was made uh, in November last year, and I told him about this, I think, last August or July, he was amazed, he was surprised. He said, and what did we answer? I said, nothing. There was no answer, and, but when we reminded the Department of Justice about this formal proposal from the Russian Prosecutor General, they orally told us, well, I th we are not interested. You remember the Americans were not interested when the Tsarnaev brothers in Boston Marathon uh, terrorist attack. Uh, on Tsarnaev brothers being dangerous, Russia warned the United States more than one year before this incident. The FBI said, they are our citizens, don't worry. Fine, but my point is that if you want to discuss cybercrime, if you want to reduce cybercrime, you have to be professional, not uh, Russophobic. Let's get back to, to the facts. You deny this, you know, the international community of the United States. No, we did not deny this. They did not prove it. Okay, so you're not denying presumption, it. Presumption of innocence. So you're not denying it. No, I'm trying to put myself in the, in the shoes of the American right. politicians. Okay, so let me now And say President Obama, American of course, is a lawyer. He has been right. educated so as a lawyer. So he's an American politician, the Republican congressman, chair of the House Homeland Security Committee, saying Vladimir Putin's regime has crossed a line and he should know that the United States will not allow our political process or our future to be dictated by foreign adversaries. So that is what they're saying. And you deny it or you say they haven't proved it, but what about motive? President Putin himself, when asked by Bloomberg, said, does it even matter who hacked this data from the campaign headquarters of Mrs. Clinton? Is that really important? The important thing is the content that was given to the public, that it was a public service. So he's spoken on this. Now that it, now, now that it entered the public domain, of course it is a known fact. Well, right? he's saying that it was a public service that this hack stuff from the Democratic campaign came out into the public. But here's the next question. It appears that Russia is intervening on the side of one particular presidential candidate. Your own UN ambassador went to the Secretary General last month. He said it, and other diplomats have said it, and basically called on the carpet the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who made a speech about the danger of demagogues and mentioned people like Trump and Prime Minister Orban and Marine Le Pen and Hurt Wilders and Herbert Noffer and all these demagogic right-wing populists in Europe. Trump was... You mean the High Commissioner was demagogic? He is... he criticized demagogues. But I believe he was demagogic. Well, my question is, they, Mr. Cherkin says he was ordered by headquarters, in other words, by you, his boss, to make this day march to the UN Secretary General. Did you, and you, if so, why? You started your questions by saying, it appears. And I believe that this is very right way to describe what is, what is going ask, on. Why would you ask? I'll you explain. I'm answering, I'm an, I'm, I'm answering your question. Trump. When the High Commission of Refugees made absolutely inappropriate statement, uh, because his position is not about uh, passing a ruling or passing judgment, on sovereign states. His position is, protect, is to protect human rights. And this does not involve intervention in domestic affairs. It does not involve giving characteristics to foreign leaders. And this was the... Most of them are not this was, this was, Most of them are parties who have been accused you of you mentioned, you, you, mentioned, you, you mentioned Prime Minister Orban, one, you mentioned one, some one, other leaders. One Prime Minister. And uh, what we... What we told Vitaly Churkin to convey to the Secretary General was exactly what I'm telling you now, that it was totally inappropriate for High Commission of Refugees to go well beyond his mandate, which is not, which is not passing judgment without any uh, in investigation into one or another political personality, period. The name, the name of Pre Prime Minister Orban, the name of uh, Donald Trump, any other name was never mentioned, and it was not about... That's it, not what the diplomats there say. They say he specifically mentioned well, Trump. Well, and it the looks diplomats, like the, if is you listen, along on this, this Christian, if, if, you, if, on if, if you listen to what, to what diplomats say, uh, then you have to analyze what my good friend Jean Marc Ayrault is saying, what Boris Johnson is saying. They are really agitated. They, they cannot stop, and uh, I can very formally and very responsibly tell you that Vitaly Churkin 
received the instructions to make a demarche regarding unacceptable behavior of the Human Rights Commissioner vis-à-vis -vis his mandate. Not about any person, because his, his job is to look on, into violations of human rights. Not, uh, and he cannot himself just decide who is, who is right and who, and who is wrong. Do you agree with what Hillary Clinton said during the last debate, that clearly Russia has made it very clear that it does not want her to win the presidency? What, what do you expect if Hillary Clinton wins? And you're seeing no, the polls moving. Uh, I am not paid to, to, to be in the expectation business. Uh, what Hillary Clinton no, says, as a, as a I, can, I, cannot, I cannot argue with Hillary Clinton. Uh, I worked with her as Secretary of State. Uh, we signed a deal, by the way, uh, some 2012, I believe, on visa liberalization, visa facilitation between the Russian and the American citizens, uh, which I believe is still quite useful. I cannot comment on what is going on uh, in the uh, United Nations presidential campaign. United of course, States. United States presidential campaign, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, I, uh, of course, I watch from time to time uh, what they show on TV, but it's up to the American people. And we, uh, you know. Are you worried about this proportional we, response that the White House has suggested is going to happen? It's, it's really, uh, it's not uh, worth, uh, I believe, uh, speculating. If they decided to do something, let them do it. But to say that Russia is interfering in the United States domestic matters uh, is ridiculous. Uh, may I remind you and, and, your, and your viewers uh, that a uh, couple of years ago, after the Ukrainian crisis, after this unconstitutional coup uh, in Kiev, the US Congress uh, passed um, a law, uh, I think Ukrainian Democracy Support Act, which instructed directly the State Department to support democratic NGOs, democratic civil society in Russia in order to make Russia more democratic. This is the direct uh, instruction uh, to, the, to the State Department to interfere into domestic matters of the Russian Federation. We never do this and we will never do this. And by the way, by the way when uh, the Soviet Union and the United States established diplomatic relations, uh, we exchanged, our countries exchanged notes. Uh, in those notes, on the insistence of, insistence of the United States, there was a commitment, an obligation by each of us uh, not to interfere into domestic affairs of each other. And a couple of years ago, we suggested to Washington to reiterate this pledge. They refused. Um, I want to just end by asking you a big picture question. Relations seem to be very, very bad. I mean, really bad between you and the United States. You have moved, Russia has moved um, missiles capable of, of nuclear warheads into Kaliningrad, which is, as we know, next to a couple of NATO countries. Uh, your defense uh, department has threatened uh, any U.S. military action in Syria, saying that it would be taken as a direct threat uh, to Russian servicemen and warned them not to do it. And your president has pulled out of several agreements which were to do with disposing the nuclear missile, uh, the nuclear material plutonium. Is it going to get worse? I mean, people are kind of worried. Is this a, a Cold War moment? Is this, could this degenerate into an actual war between the two sides? Well, I, I don't think so. It is not our intention at all. Uh, we read, of course, statements of the American military that the war is inevitable with Russia. Uh, I leave this uh, on their conscience. Uh, as regards uh, deployment of weapons uh, on our territory, this is our territory. And, uh, it's pretty scary. Uh, well, it's our territory. But the plans of the United States, not only to, well, they quadrupled, I think, the, the um, money uh, allocated to uh, support uh, military deployment in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, then they moved uh, NATO infrastructure next to our borders. Now the American, I think, F-35s, the, the latest planes, uh, would, be, would be equipped with the modern uh, version of uh, nuclear bombs and they would be deployed on the Russian, on the Russian borders. And this is not the United States territory. 
so it was not it was not our intention, uh, you know, to drop uh, from various treaties which used to serve as cornerstones for strategic stability. But when the ABM Treaty was abrogated by the United States, uh, George Bush told Vladimir Putin, uh, I understand that you don't like it, but we are not enemies anymore. So if you want to take any precautions, any countermeasures, you are free to do so. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, missile defense project became uh, quite, quite uh, disturbing for the, for the global stability and the plans uh, to uh, basically uh, put uh, the European segment and Asian segment uh, makes us uh, very much concerned because there is a clear attempt to gain one-sided one uh, advantage. As regards plutonium agreement, uh, I hope you, you know that the United States uh, did not uh, implement its obligations uh, because they could not, uh, they actually changed the, the method of utilizing plutonium which was described in the agreement and the agreement became invalid because the United States uh, failed to implement its obligations. We did implement our obligations and we will continue to do this. A couple of other agreements uh, were uh, about cooperation uh, between Russia and the United States on nuclear issues, nuclear energy. Uh, but uh, I explained to John Kerry long ago that uh, two, two years and a half ago, uh, soon after the Ukrainian crisis, the Department of Energy sent a formal note uh, to the Russian Federation saying that under the circumstances they suspend all cooperation under these agreements. So two years passed, nothing happened, they still don't want to cooperate in spite of the fact that Kerry assured me that this was stupid and he would make sure that this is not the case, that our cooperation in nuclear energy and nuclear safety must not suffer. Uh, but probably nobody actually did anything. Uh, so uh, take it as just registering the, the factual situation, not as us dropping from something which is alive and important. Okay, so I just want to ask you a quick question. Um, Van Cliburn, the Texan musician. Van Cliburn was very, very well loved. A new book has come out about him, and it sort of raises a nostalgia for even during the Cold War, there was this cultural, you know, joy between Russia and the United States. He was very well loved here, he was very well loved there. Tell me about that. When you, when you think about that moment, how does it make you feel? Well, I feel sorry for what is happening now uh, in Russian-American relations. I believe we uh, have a lot in common uh, with the U.S. people and that the level of uh, common citizens uh, we normally find a very good understanding. Uh, politicians have their own agenda, uh, but I can only reaffirm that it was not us uh, who started this uh, very unhealthy uh, kind of uh, relationship. And this started long before Ukraine, long before Syria. Uh, I had a chance some time ago to, to, to address this issue. And let's, let's uh, remember about the uh, Magnitsky law, uh, about what happened, what reaction uh, was um, uh, received from Washington after Snowden found himself on the Russian soil. President Obama even cancelled his bilateral visit to Moscow uh, because we did not extradite Snowden. And uh, they really believed that we played a role in, you know, attracting him to Russia and uh, making him uh, recruited by our security. Uh, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous situation because the guy was flying not to Russia, he was flying to some Latin American country. And as he took off, uh, from Hong Kong, uh, as he was airborne, they deprived him of his passport and we received a formal notification that his passport is invalid and we could not legally allow him to board any plane. We couldn't allow him even to uh, disembark in the Russian Federation. And so he was kept in the terminal and then he addressed the, the request to, to give him some kind of asylum or refuge uh, and this was granted. But this case alone uh, triggered such nervous reaction that, as I said, President Obama canceled his visit to Moscow. So being offended 
in politics and uh, not being able to, to, to measure your response, I think uh, sometimes uh, brings us to, to very unfortunate mistakes. Foreign Minister, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Can I just try one last question? One last question. A bit cheeky, but I'm going to ask you. Um, Russia had its own pussy riot moment. What do you think of Donald Trump's pussy riot moment? Well, uh, I don't know whether this would... I, English is not my mother tongue. I don't know whether I would, be, I, I would sound, uh, I mean, uh, decent. Um, there are so many pussies around your presidential campaign on both sides that I prefer not to comment about this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> That's going in. <coughs> All right. Thank you again.